True Crime Dropouts may contain some graphic and explicit content that may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hey guys, you're listening to True Crime Dropouts. I'm Mary. And I'm Vanessa. And today we are going to talk about Wayne Nance. Ooh. Have you heard of Wayne Nance? I feel like it rings a bell, but then again, there's a pattern of Waynes yeah, in the yeah, true crime world, so I might not know this case. Okay, so Wayne was born in Missoula, Montana on October 18th, 1955. His mother worked as a waitress and his father as a trucker. They were a young family. I'm pretty sure he was only a child. I didn't see anything about siblings. And they lived in a mobile home on the outskirts of town. Uh, it was known that Wayne did well in school. He earned A's and B's. But he was hot-headed and was known to be a troublemaker. Mm. Regardless, though, he like school came easy to him and he just... He graduated, no issues. Uh, And as an adult, I guess as a young adult, Wayne was considered a bit odd, but he was well-liked around around their town. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have that little backstory on Mr. Wayne, and now we're gonna we're gonna talk about some instances that had had happened. So Living several houses down from the Nance family home was the Pounds family. Uh, Donna was the mother. She worked at a Christian bookstore in Missoula. Well, Harvey, the father, worked at Yance Men's Store. I didn't really look into that. I'm assuming it's maybe like a men's clothing store. Yeah, it sounds kind of like um, like it would be like a suit store or something. Yeah. Uh, it was. They were extremely religious. Harvey was the deacon of the local Baptist church. Ooh. Yeah. They had three children. Kenny, who was off in the army. I, I'm not sure how old he was. I didn't. I couldn't find that. But he was off in the army. Karen, 20, and Kathy, 12, who both still lived at home with their parents. On the 11th of April, 1974... When Donna was home alone and Harvey and Karen were at work and Kathy was at school, a man crept into the family home while Donna was in her room and retrieved Harvey's 22 caliber Luger and pretty much held Donna at gunpoint and and tied her up. He tied her up spread eagle on the bed. And he, t- he tied her up with clothesline that he had brought from home, I'm assuming. I don't know. Hmm. He then raped her and took her down to the basement. He pushed her underneath the stairs and shot her five times in the back of the head. Oh, my God. Yeah. So a neighbor told police... That she had seen a man who looked a lot like Wayne Nance in the vicinity of the Pound's home that afternoon. However, when Wayne was questioned, he denied he had any involvement and claimed he was homesick all day. And he also, he was also like a friend of the family. I don't know if he was friends with Harvey or whatnot, like whatnot, Mm -hmm. but he did go over to their house relatively often. He was like a regular at going to this house. I don't know if it was for religious reasons or if they were actual friends, Mm -hmm. but he did go to the house often and he knew where Harvey kept his weapons. The police obtained a search warrant of Wayne Nance's home and discovered a bloodstained pair of underwear that had recently been washed. They were able to confirm that the bloodstain was human but they couldn't confirm who it came from. Wayne was considered high on the suspect list, of course, but they had no physical evidence to connect him to the actual crimes. 
And so he wasn't like charged or anything like that. Yeah, because I'm sus- assuming they yeah. probably couldn't like get any DNA from washed underwear. Yeah. I, I must I don't I, I don't know how their like rape kits worked back then. I don't know if you wore protection. I don't whoever the you know, I don't know how that worked. Yeah. But they weren't able to link him. However, another very big suspect in this case was Mr. Harvey. Mm. It was discovered that he had been having an affair. And they were, it was, you know, it could have been a potential motive to murder his wife. But again. The deacon was the having deacon. an affair? Yes. Mr. Deacon. Mm-hmm. Scandalous. I am holding this Oreo very shockingly. <laughs> I you am, should see your face. I am shooketh. I know. The deacon. The deacon. So, again, no evidence were, was there to connect him to the actual murder. So, eventually, the case went cold. So, in 1990... Eh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, I'm dyslexic today, apparently. <laughs> in 1979... A railroad, a railroad worker discovered the decomposed body of a young woman near I-90 in Minnesota. Miss Missoula, sorry, not Minnesota. Missoula. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. She was Caucasian and was wearing a flower print dress. Police searched through missing persons reports but were unable to identify her. Therefore, she became known as Betty Beavertail. And I, I was kind of curious of why they came up with that name. But she was named after the nearby Beavertail Hill State Park. Okay. Yeah, because I was like, that's, like, why not just Jane Doe? But yeah, yeah that makes that's, sense. Yeah, that's their, their variation, I guess, in Montana. Because you'll see in a few other crimes, they use... The place where the body was found. Yeah, because in our Robert Hansen case, they had named two of the women after, I think it was, one was after a lake that she mm-hmm. was found near, and then another one, it was like a, I think it was like a trail, but yeah, instead of using like Jane Doe, they called them by what they were yeah. near. So in the summer of 1984, Wayne started dating a woman from out of town known as Robin. They dated through the summer... And on and, and around September, the couple the couple left town, presumably to start their own you know family and life together. Mm-hmm. So the you know people of the town were just like, oh, you know Wayne found him found him a nice girl, you know, maybe they're going to start their lives together. I don't yeah, know. doesn't seem too out far of fetched. The... Yeah, yeah. At this point, I'm, I'm Wayne's like in his thirties, so. It was, I guess it was probably like, okay, bound to happen. Mm-hmm. So a little while, less than three months later, a wildlife photographer trudging through the woods in M- Missoula came across a human foot poking out of the ground. Police arrived at the scene and unearthed the body. It was a young woman. Pathology determined that she had been dead for around three months. Police searched through missing persons reports, but none matched the features of the dead woman. How, whoever she was, she met a brutal, a very brutal death. There were three gunshot wounds to her head. She, she had no identification, like nothing, no wallet, no, nothing was around mm-hmm. to identify her in any way. And she became known as Debbie Deer Creek. She was buried near... Or she was buried in the the Deer Creek drainage. Mm-hmm. And so they named her after that. Then in September of 1985, a bear hunter found skeletal remains scattered along the hillside in West Missoula, again of a, another young woman. She had two bullets lodged in her skull, no personal items that could identify her. And was known as Christy Crystal Creek. She was likely of Asian ethnicity, 
a Asian ethnicity and had dental work unique to Asia. She was left-handed and took really good care of her teeth. Vanessa and I had to take a brief intermission and we were talking about Christy Crystal Creek facial reconstruction doll thing and how terrifying it is. We will post it and so you can so you guys can also experience, experience this terror. Because I've seen a lot of facial reconstructions because I like looking at like the FBI website for those like that tab that has like oh more information needed. And there's a mm-hmm. lot of facial reconstructions on there because obviously they want to find information on these bodies that they've found. Mm-hmm. But I always feel like they all look the same and I always feel like they don't look human. Mm-hmm. They're kind of scary. Kind of scary, guys. Okay, so the following year on December 12th, 1985, Mike and Teresa shook and their three young children had just finished dinner when they heard a very aggressive knock on their front door. When Mike opened the door, a man lunged in at him with a butcher knife and stabbed him to death. Teresa was grabbed and dragged into the bedroom where she was tied up, stabbed, raped, and stabbed to death. Afterwards, the man set the house on fire to, I guess, conceal the evidence, but... Luckily, miraculously, thankfully, the three young children escaped the home unharmed. That's good. So, meanwhile, Mr. Wayne worked at Collins Furniture as a delivery driver. Apparently, Wayne had a crush on his boss's on his boss, a married woman named Chris Wells. One night on September One night in September of 1986, Chris and her husband, Doug, were returning home around midnight when Doug thought he saw someone lurking outside their home in in the dark and went to investigate. Once, Once investigating, he finds Wayne in their bushes. Of course, Doug is like, what you doing in my bushes, man? Mm-hmm. Wayne explains that he had been driving past and thought he saw someone looking in their window. And so he was, you know, checking out the scene. Wayne then told Doug, well, when he asked Doug to go inside and get a flashlight so they can investigate some more and try to see, you know, if they can find this, you know, perpetrator that was looking in the windows. However... When Doug turned his back, Wayne pistol whipped him on the back of his head with the gun and Doug fell to the floor and he started bleeding like profusely from this head wound. Oh my God. So the two men struggled on the floor and Chris rushes to see what was going on. Wayne then pointed the gun at her and forced her to tie her husband's hands and feet before Wayne tied hers. With Doug and Chris both bound, Wayne took Chris to the bedroom and tied her to the bed and then went back to take care of Doug. With his hands and feet tied, he forced Doug into the basement. I don't know how poor Doug walked down these stairs. I'm assuming maybe he untied his feet. But it just says, with his hands and feet tied, he forced Doug down the stairs. Maybe he threw him down the stairs. I don't know. But they're in the basement, and Wayne ties Doug's neck to a pole. Like, you know how they have like those exposed poles in basements? Yeah. And then pulls out a 8-inch butcher knife. Wayne then stabs Doug right in the chest, missing his heart by, like, centimeters. Wayne believes that Doug is dead, and he, he leaves him to, you know, die or He just leaves him downstairs and heads back upstairs to finish off what he was planning to do with Chris. Mm -hmm. However, Doug was not dead. 
Despite being beaten and stabbed in the chest, Doug was alive and conscious. Doug managed to free himself and retrieve his 250 rifle. He staggered up the stairs and confronted Wayne and shot him in the side. Wayne dropped to the ground and attempted to get back up. And when doing that, Doug began to beat him with the rifle. He continued to do so until Wayne stopped moving. Both Wayne and Doug were rushed to the hospital, and Wayne died of his injuries. But miraculously, Doug survived. So, Mr. Wayne died. Similar to my last case, where, where the perpetrator criminal but the difference dies before. Here, yeah, this is more fair. This is definitely is that that guy some, killed himself because he's a coward. Yes. To where this guy, Aaron Hotchner, his ass. Yeah, got the crap you know? beaten out of him. For all of those who watch Criminal Minds, we all remember the episode where mm-hmm. Aaron's wife gets killed by Foyette, right? And he beats the crap out of homeboy, and he dies. That's what this guy did to Wayne, Mm -hmm. and he deserved Mm it. Yep. So after Wayne's death, police uncovered that his attempted murder was not an isolated incident. Wayne was linked to six different murders, and in his home he found a photograph of, of him with a Marcy... Batchman. When Marcy was 16, she went missing from her Vancouver home, leaving behind a family who had no clue, like, what happened to her. I'm thinking... Sorry, excuse me. I'm thinking she was originally a runaway. I think that's... I think that's what I read. Um, And she left, you know, she left her home in Vancouver... And somehow ended up in Montana. Uh, In 2006, DNA testing showed that the woman known as Debbie Deer Creek was Marcy. Wow. So they were able to later identify her. So Marcy was Robin. And it... It, it like seems that as soon as they like left town to start this life together, he mm. like he killed her. her. Damn. And um, it was also known. It was eventually, I guess, found out that Marcy used Robin as an alias after leaving home. Yeah, that's probably why like so, no one could find her or anything like that. Yeah. So in two thousand nine. Betty Beavertail was also identified as a 14-year-old Devana Nelson, a runaway who had been hitchhiking through Missoula from Seattle. It was the Christie Crystal Creek. Hmm. And her remains... Oh, wait, sorry, 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 sorry. Betty Beavertail was Donna Nelson. Christie Crystal Creek's remains are still unidentified but it is presumed that she is also a victim of Wayne okay but the only the only one that we have facial reconstruction for is the uh the crystal Christy. creek okay yeah crystal creek i'm i think they actually did facial reconstruction for betty and for um i guess robin marcy mm-hmm. um I, I think they did, but I think because Crystal Christy, Crystal Creek, or yeah, Christy Crystal Creek, this is like tongue twisters yeah. where it was never, you know, yeah, because she was, was never identified. Yeah, because I'm I was pretty looking sure at her, looking up the picture, the poster from the FBI website comes up where mm-hmm. um, they ask for like more information. But I was looking on here because I know you said that. They had suspected she was of Asian descent. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to figure out, like, how did they know? Because. Um, oh, it's they said they knew because well, she had Asian dental, dental work. Treat, but um, it, on, on the poster, 
it specifies her ethnicity as Japanese. Hmm. So I'm trying to figure out like how they knew that or how they know. know or estimate that she's Japanese. I don't know. You know, because mm-hmm. like I could understand like getting oh she's probably Asian from the dental work, but mm-hmm. I don't know if there's anything like in in your bones or something. Because I know I've heard like usually like you can tell like where someone's from what they ate or something like that from like your um your teeth because of like dental here's some other ones that they did of debbie see those don't look human either yeah debbie deer creek and that or debbie yeah yeah debbie deer creek and they said that the other one is christy crystal creek but they don't look human. You see, like, it looks like the same person, but with, like, a different wig. Yeah. I don't we'll know. post these on our page, because... So you guys know what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, because these facial reconstructions, they just look like the same person to me, but with, like, a different hairstyle. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I would like to know, like, what identifies her as Japanese. Because yeah, I know with, sure. like, forensic odontology... There's like a way mm-hmm. to figure out like what you've eaten and stuff and like maybe where you were from, but I don't know if that would pinpoint like, your whole yeah, ethnicity, your yeah. like genealogy. Yeah, it's interesting. I'd like to know if, what. And in that I'm pretty material. sure Christy Crystal Creek's remains were like the most decomposed. Yeah. They only found skeletal remains, and they were scattered across a hillside. Mm. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that they might have not been able to find, like, flesh or, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah. Along Especially with because the skeletal in that time, remains. it's different forensically than it is now. Yeah, that's why it's, it took, like, to 2006 and 2009 to find... Mm-hmm. That these were Devana and um, Marcy. Yeah. That's crazy. It's just another reason why I refuse to go hiking. I don't... (laughs) I don't know if I want to encounter a body, (laughs) y'all. Oh, I took a weird breath. (laughs) Like, I like going for jogs and stuff, but even then, like, I... I get scared. (laughs) Honestly, like, I'm one of those, like, I'm going to just stay on the trail. I don't want to, you know, veer Veer. off and stumble upon anything. Yeah, no, like, that one time that we went kind of, like, on our little hike. Yeah. I mean, we were on a trail, but I was vigilant. (laughs) I was afraid we were going to encounter a femur or something. Yeah. Yeah, no. And it was at, like, a, a local park. Yeah, it was a local park, but, I mean, hey. Near a you, neighborhood. You, you, you find bodies everywhere. So. Yeah. You never know. You I, mean, never I guess. Know. I guess. But that's my case. It's a short one. Yeah, it is pretty short. Yeah. It's a, 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 little, a little one. Yeah. Well, let us know what you guys think. If you guys mm-hmm. ever been hiking... Have you encountered a body? Let us know. I'm curious. How was that experience? Yeah, I actually am really curious. Um, How do you go? You just, like, call the police. Like, hey, found a body. I would, like, run and then be like, 911. (laughs) I stumbled upon. Imagine being, like, the person that stumbles upon, like, the Black Dahlia. That lady was, if I was walking my baby... Just mm-hmm. in the neighborhood, and I saw that. I don't know what I would do. Like, literally, it was just, like, in, in somebody's front yard. Yeah. I don't know what I would do. I'd crap myself. For sure. But, yeah, guys, that's that's my case. Yeah. Um, let us know what you guys think. Mm-hmm. Leave us mm-hmm. your comments, questions, or concerns. <laughs> <laughs> And we'll see you guys in the next one. See ya. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you'd like more content like you just heard, 
add us on patreon.com forward slash true crime dropouts. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at true crime dropouts. And don't forget, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and more. If we aren't on your favorite streaming service, let us know and we will see what we can do. Stay in school. (laughs) 